We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was recorded, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present. Hello, I'm Ant Middleton and welcome to 2024. Wishing you all a very happy new year and hoping you've all had a bit of rest and reset, ready to take 2024 by storm. We'll be back with some more incredible head game stories on the 17th of January. But until then, I've been reflecting on some of my favourite moments on the podcast so far. I've spoken to so many amazing people and some of them truly have beaten the odds. Today, I want to look back on those people who have survived the unthinkable. First off, let's look back at my very first guest on head game. Todd Russell. Todd spent nearly two weeks trapped a kilometre underground in the Beaconsfield mine disaster. On my right leg, this this was probably the hardest thing that I endured while I was underground. So I sat there and I wrote a goodbye letter or goodbye note to every individual of the family, mum, dad, Carolyn, Trent, Madison, Liam, brother, sister, a whole lot, just on my left leg, you know, just saying, look, I can't. I can't even remember what I wrote, but there was a there's a little note to, to each of them, so that you know when you know our bodies were recovered, that, and that's what we did, and that was the first six days, and it wasn't until the the Sunday afternoon is there was two gentlemen that came back down to the the nine twenty five level, and as I said, unfortunately Larry lost his life, and his body was recovered two days into the rescue, and. That area then became a crime scene, so it was cordoned off for investigation purposes. You know, processes in place, and now it's now it's a crime scene. It had to be guarded by mines inspectors and stuff like that, so that you know, if our bodies were recovered, then they do the full investigation. And these two gentlemen, like I said, come back down to that area, and they made made a remark to the the mines inspector that maybe you need to have a coffee, and. Um, he sort of twigged on on what was happening, and he said to the, he said to the guys, he said, "Look, it'll take me about fifteen minutes to have a coffee." So no sooner did that um, mines inspector go out of sight, they entered the the nine twenty five level at their own risk, and that's what they did. They entered at their own risk because it was such a heavily devastated. Yeah. As I said earlier, Brant and I were two completely different people, and apart from two things we had in common, we both married high school sweethearts. And we both knew how to sing Kenny Rogers as a gambler. So, <laughs> so a lot of Kenny Rogers going on down there, was yeah, it? Yeah, but music in general is another healer. and Another motivator, yep, right? Yeah, and mm-hmm. jokes. Like yep. Brant, Brant, Morale. Yep, Brant, Brant is a joker. And, you know, throughout the course of the rescue, I had my strengths. He had his strengths. So we relied on each other's strengths to get us through. But that Sunday afternoon- we Saved each other, ultimately. Yep, Pretty much. And then, so that Sunday when these two gentlemen entered the 925 level to do that so-called risk assessment, we were singing The Gambler, you know. And then I remember <laughs> remember, that. I remember lying, that. There on, lying there on our back singing The Gambler and mm-hmm. it didn't sound real good, but it, it, was, <laughs> it was morale boosting. And then all of a sudden I just hear this noise and I said to Brent, shut up. And he said, why? I said, no, 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 shut up, shut up, shut up. And then I yelled out, is there anyone out there? And this voice come back. Our hearts just sunk. Hear the rest of Todd's miraculous survival story in the full episode. I'll link it in the show notes. My next guest also survived the unthinkable when he came face to face with a 300 pound bull shark. Paul de Gelder is a shark attack survivor turned conservationist. In the water, swimming along, thinking about sharks. Get this big <laughs> whack in my leg, not thinking too much of it because it didn't really hurt. And I turn around and there's a giant shark's head attached to my body. Wow. So, so you hit this thing, you think it's you think it's something else, and then you turn around and you're literally face to face with this. Sh- what's the first thing you see? Just when you turn around, what's the first thing you see, Paul? What well, the funny thing is when when you haven't seen something ever before in your life, 
it's hard for your brain to process it. Like I remember flying to South Africa one time uh, from Australia and you go across like um, the, the Antarctic, just you kind of touch on it. And I looked out the window and I couldn't, I couldn't fathom what I was seeing. Like I thought it might be the Antarctic, but it was, it was white and shiny and it had like what looked like roofs and squiggly lines. My brain couldn't work it out. And that's what happened with the shark. It took me, felt like a couple of seconds to work out what I was actually looking at because it's just not something that you think you're going to see in your whole life, a giant shark with its teeth embedded into your leg and a big eye just staring at you. Um, so wow. it, it finally, you know, my instincts kicked in and I thought, you know, I've seen the Crocodile Hunter. I've seen I've seen Shark Week on Discovery Channel. I'll jab it in the eyeball. But it had my leg and my hand, so I couldn't get it with my right hand. I couldn't reach the eye with my left hand. Uh, I tried to push it off, but that didn't do anything. And so the, the final thing that they mentioned is you punched it in the nose. And so I cocked back to punch it in the nose, but then the shark, I guess, decides that I'm edible, starts thrashing me around with its mouth. Um, the pain from the teeth just tearing through my flesh and my muscle of my hand and my leg took every ounce of fight out of me. And I was just a rag doll getting taken underwater and ripped apart. So I didn't think I was going to make it out of the water that day. I just thought I was going to die. Former French spy and fighter pilot Jack Beaumont was doing dogfight training when a crash changed everything. I crashed uh, with the jet. I was doing this training over France, uh, air to air uh, combat training, and um, I pulled too many G's uh, in a wrong pos- in a bad position in the plane. So I was totally twisted in my seat because I was watching, looking behind on the other guy coming on me. Mm-hmm. And when I saw him, I was totally twisted in my seat. And when I saw him, I had to, to counter and t- uh, reduce his turning room uh, so that he overshoots and I can reverse and kill him be- behind. Right. And I took 11.3 Gs, but twisted in the seat. Uh, so my spine was compressed and twisted in the same time, but it's putting basically 650 kilos on the lower back, but twisted. So you had the expulsion of three discs on the lower back, on, on the lumbar spine. So the, the disc popped out on, on the left side. As so, you're manoeuvring, as you're pulling, the, yeah, as you're doing that manoeuvre yeah, yeah. to, to counter, back, to, yeah, to counter, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. get the, uh, you know, the, the fighter pilot. Yeah. You do that during it, it pops, boom. Yeah, the three disc popped out because my spine was compressed and twisted in the same time. Wow. So it has been pushing out the three disc on the lower back. 11 Gs. 11.3, yeah. <sighs> Listen, no, nine uh, <laughs> people talk about getting to 10 Gs is like impossible to, to survive. Yeah, it's pretty violent. Uh, and, and so uh, all the nerves uh, of the left leg were pinched. Yeah. So I was paralyzed of the left leg in the plane. The pain was very intense. Uh, so just before fainting, I had the time to put uh, pure oxygen over pressure in my helmet, in my oxygen mask, not to faint. Right. So basically the oxygen is pure oxygen yep. instead of air. This is a sort and of protocol that you do if you're in, yeah, but in the shit, the basically. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. But and then it forces its uh, itself to to your lengths, you know, like yeah. so it goes so in, it's like yeah. just pushes it's it over into pressure. Your lungs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that kept you awake. Yeah, kept me awake, but the pain was massive. Um, and the problem is when you land, you control the front wheel of the plane with your legs, and you brake on the top of the feet. Uh, and my left leg was not working anymore. Um, so um, uh, the the flight director on the radio said, okay, you, you go to the ejection zone area and you bail out. And I said, no, no way, because ejection seats, uh, you don't do it for fun. It's uh, 25 instant Gs. That compresses um, the spine in itself, yeah, doesn't it? You're, yeah. already, you're already fucked. You know, yeah, exactly. You're already in a bad way. You, yeah. you're, you're paralyzed by, on one side of the body. That could potentially kill you. Yeah, well, you have two tons uh, of pressure per square centimeter under the seat. Um, so basically from the moment you pull the handle, 1.3 seconds after you're under the chute. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really violent. Uh, and as I already had a problem in the spine, uh, I would have been... Uh, best dead 
and worse, I would have been in a chair for the rest of my life and not the other way around. Yeah. And so I decided to try to learn the plane and I had a brilliant idea on the paper. It was just on the paper. I thought that if I leave uh, my right leg smooth, uh, then I could uh, press with my hands on my knees to try to control the front wheel because the left leg was not working. And so I thought if I leave the right one smooth, I will manage to control the front wheel. But of course it didn't work. <laughs> it wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah. So only the right leg had been breaking. And so I went out the runway on the right side, uh, hitting the grass, landing gear went in. So I just had the time to push down the crash barret, so cutting all the hydraulic, electric, fuel, etc. And then I went uh, uh, on a fireball, basically on the, on the right side of the runway. Uh, so I broke uh, all the left side uh, of the body. So I woke up. I woke up at the hospital after the surgery with two big tubes in the. In so the you back. hit. What's the last memory that you have when you hit? Oh, when the plane went out uh, out the runway on the right side. Uh, so we land at in this kind of emergency. We land at 180 knots. Uh, so it's uh, 340 k per hour. Um, <sighs> but it's, it's a good uh, good accident. Uh, so I, 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 I very good accident, a decent, Jack. decent one. Yeah. So I, I uh, woke up at the hospital after the surgery. Uh, then, so I was strapped on the bed because everything was broken. I couldn't move. Blah blah blah. And so the surgeon came, and I said, uh, "When, when will I be able to fly again?" And he said, "Ah, uh, I think my young friend, you mm. don't well understand the situation. Your uh, pilot career just ends here." Mm. And I said, I don't think so. X-ray, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I don't think so. Three stories of unbelievable, miraculous survival. Hear more about these life-changing moments from Todd Russell, Paul de Gelder and Jack Beaumont now. I've linked them all in the show notes. Thanks for listening to Head Game. I'm coming to Australia very soon with my Fear Bubble Tour. Tickets are on sale now from Ticketek or linked in the show notes. Catch you next time.